part three chapters five six and seven of bessie's fortune by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain five bessie's decision and so you have determined to go to america neil said to bessie about four weeks later when he came to stoneleigh in obedience to a letter from bessie telling him she wished to see him on a matter of importance yes she replied i am going to america my passage is engaged and i sail in two weeks in company with a mrs goodenough of bangor a nice old lady who will take good care of me well and neil stroked his moustache thoughtfully i am not sure but that it is a good idea to beard the old woman in her den you will be likely to succeed where others would fail and when you are sure of her fortune send for me there was a levity in his manner which bessie resented and she said to him quickly if by the old woman you mean my aunt betsy i would rather you did not speak of her thus she has been kind to father and me very kind but it is not her fortune i am going after it is my own i have always thought i had one somewhere and as it does not seem to be here it may be in america but jesting aside i am going to find something to do it is no disgrace to work there and your friends will never know i am not sure of that neil said but what do you mean to do anything i can find bessie answered decidedly neil only smiled and thought how sure it was that once with her aunt she would become a favourite and eventually an heiress to the fortune he so greatly coveted he should miss her he knew and still it would be a relief not to have her on his mind as she would be if left alone at stoneleigh so on the whole she had done wisely when she planned to go to america and he did not oppose her but said he would be in liverpool the twenty fifth to see her off he did not ask if she had the necessary funds for the voyage he had trouble enough on that score and was not likely soon to forget the scene or rather succession of scenes enacted at trevelyan house when mrs meredith's bills were presented to his mother who but for shame's sake would have repudiated them at once as something she was not lawfully obliged to pay neither did he inquire who mrs goodenough was and did not know that she was a poor woman who had worked in the fields and was going out to new york not as first-class passenger or even second but as steerage and bessie's ticket was of the same nature she had but little money and when she heard from mrs goodenough who was a friend of dorothy's and who had once been in america that a steerage passage was oftentimes very comfortable and that many respectable people took it because of its cheapness she put aside all feelings of pride and said to mrs goodenough i will go steerage with you and from this plan she never swerved but she would not tell neil then time enough at the last when he came to see her off and must of course know the truth she knew he would be very angry and probably insist upon paying the difference but she could take no more money from him and her blood was hot whenever she reflected what she had heard him say to flossie of the bills incurred in rome and which she meant to pay to the uttermost farthing if her life was spared and she found something to do in the new world where to work was not degrading but she must know the amount and she timidly asked neil to tell her how much it was enough i assure you those italians are rascals and cheats the whole of them but it need not trouble you that debt is paid he said a little bitterly but bessie insisted upon knowing and finally wrung from him that two hundred and fifty pounds would probably cover the whole indebtedness bringing mother home and all bessie asked and he replied yes bringing her home and all that was a useless expense he spoke before he thought and when he saw how quickly the tears came to bessie's eyes he repented the act and stooping down to kiss her he said forgive me bessie i did not mean to wound you but mother did fret so about the bills you know she did not like your mother tell her i shall pay them all bessie answered as she withdrew herself from the arm he had thrown around her my mother was my own and with all her faults i loved her and i believe she was a good woman at the last i should die if i did not yes oh yes of course neil said feeling very awkward and uncertain what to say next at last he asked rather abruptly if bessie knew where jack trevelyan and grey gerald were saying he had never heard from either of them since he was in rome bessie replied that flossie had written that sir jack was somewhere in the bavarian alps leading a kind of bohemian life and that he had written to his steward at trevelyan castle that he should not be home until he had seen the passion play then in process of presentation at Oberamago he never writes flossie bessie said neither does she know where mr gerald is 
she wrote to him at venice but he did not answer her letter perhaps he has gone home neil said it was possible adding that she would probably see him in america as his aunt lucy lived in allington but you are not to fall in love with him he continued laughingly you are mine and i shall come to claim you as soon as you write me you have found that fortune you are going after do your best little bess and if you cannot untie the old maid's purse-strings nobody can bessie made no reply but in her heart there was a feeling which boded no good to neil who left her the next day promising to come down to liverpool and see her off six in liverpool it was a steady downpour and the streets of liverpool always black and dirty looked dirtier and blacker than ever on the day when neil macpherson walked restlessly up and down the entrance hall of the northwestern hotel now scanning the piles of baggage waiting to be taken to the germanic and then looking ruefully out upon the rain falling so steadily it is a dreary day for her to start poor little girl i wish i had money of my own and i would never let her go he said to himself as he began to realize what it would be to have bessie separated from him the breadth of the great ocean selfish and weak as we have shown neil to be he loved bessie better than he loved anything except himself and there was a load on his heart and a lump in his throat every time he thought of her she was to sail that afternoon at three and he had come from london on the night express to meet her and say good-bye his father and mother and blanche were staying at a gentleman's house a few miles from the city and he was to join them there in the evening and make one of a large dinner-party given in the honour of lady jane he had told his mother that bessie was going to america and in her delight at the good news she did not oppose his going to see her off and actually handed him a five-pound note which he was to give to bessie with her best wishes for a pleasant voyage and happiness in the new world thus armed and equipped neil waited until a whiz and a shriek outside told him the train from chester was in and going out he stood at the gate when bessie came through accompanied by mrs goodenough who carried her bag and waterproof and who curtsied very low to neil never had the latter seen bessie look as lovely as she did to him then in her simple travelling dress of black which brought out so clearly the dazzling purity of her complexion and seemed to intensify the deep blue of her large sad eyes oh bessie he exclaimed taking her hand and putting it under his arm how can i let you go where is mrs goodenough and who is this woman bobbing up and down and staring so at me neil had a great contempt for people like mrs goodenough and when bessie said to him in a low tone it is my compagnon du voyage she is rough-looking but kind and good i wish you would speak to her he answered quickly that woman you going out with her why she looks like a fish-woman she is only fit to be a steerage passenger she is a steerage passenger and i am steerage too bessie said very quietly while neil dropped her hand as if it had burned him bessie what do you mean he exclaimed glancing down upon her and stopping suddenly let us go inside do not make a scene here please bessie answered him in a low firm voice while her cheek grew a shade paler and something shone in her eyes which neil had never seen there before a private parlour please a small one will answer he said to the clerk at the bureau and in a few moments he was sitting with bessie at his side asking her to tell him what she meant by saying she was steerage too it means she began unfalteringly that i have no money for a first-class ticket which costs more than three times as much as steerage many respectable people go out that way and it is very comfortable the germanic is a new boat and all the apartments are clean and nice i am not ashamed of it i am ashamed of nothing except the debt i owe your mother and that i had to borrow five pounds of anthony who insisted upon giving it to me but i would not take it why do you look at me so strangely neil do you think i have committed the unpardonable sin bessie neil began huskily and in a voice choked with passion this is a drop too much i know you had some low instincts but never dreamed you could stoop to this degradation which affects me as much as it does you but it is not too late to change and you must do it no neil i cannot i have barely enough to get there as it is she replied and he continued mother sent you five pounds with her compliments will that do here it is and he offered her the note which she put aside quickly as she said i cannot take that from your mother give it back to her and if you think she meant it well thank her for me and tell her i shall pay the whole some day when i earn it 
she emphasized the last words and more angry than before neil exclaimed earn it why will you persist in such nonsense as if you were a common charwoman you know as well as i that you are going to aunt betsy with a hope to get some of her money as you unquestionably will neil i am not bessie answered firmly i am going to america because there i can work and be respected too while here according to your code i cannot then for heaven's sake go decently and not herd with a lot of cattle for emigrants are little better and do not make yourself a spectacle for the other passengers to gaze upon and wonder about as they will be sure to do if you have no pride for yourself you have no right to disgrace me how do you think it will sound some day that neil mcpherson's wife went out as steerage have you no feeling about it not in that way no bessie replied it seems to me i have been in the steerage all my life and this can be no worse lady bothwaite went thus to australia to see how it fared with the passengers yes and got herself well laughed at as a lunatic neil rejoined then after a pause he continued excitedly but to come to the point you must either give up this crazy plan or me i can have no share in this disgrace which the world would never forget and which mother would never forgive my wife must not come from the steerage he spoke with great decision for he was very angry and for a moment there was perfect silence between them while bessie regarded him fixedly with an expression on her face which made him uneasy for he did not quite mean all he had said to her and there was a strong clinging of his heart to this fragile little girl who said at last very softly and low you mean it neil mean what you say yes he answered her you must choose steerage or me then neil she continued taking off her engagement ring and putting it into his hand i am afraid it must be steerage there is your ring it is all ended between us and it is better that it is so i have thought for some time that we could not be happy together with our dissimilar tastes i should always be doing something you did not like and which i could not think was wrong besides this we need not deceive ourselves longer with the hope that your mother will ever consent to our marriage for she will not and as we cannot marry without it i think it better that we should part not in anger neil and she laid her hand caressingly upon his arm we have loved each other too well for that we will be friends always as we are cousins but never man and wife we are free both of us and as she spoke there kept coming over her a most delicious sense of relief as if some burden were being rolled from her and the expression of her face was not that of a young girl who has just broken with the man she loved and neil felt the change in her and rebelled against it saying that he would not give her up though she went steerage a hundred times and in his excitement he offered to marry her that day if she were willing and take her at once to his mother who would not shut the door against them when she knew the deed was done but bessie was resolute and neil was obliged to abide with her decision but his face was very gloomy and there was a sense of pain and loss in his heart when at last he entered the carriage which was to take bessie to the wharf mrs goodenough was to attend to the luggage and see that it was on board consequently neil was spared all trouble as bessie meant he should be the rain was still falling and there were many cabs and hansoms crowding the dock when neil and bessie reached it where will you go with the steerage gang if so for heaven's sake keep your veil over your face i should not like to have any friend of mine who might chance to be here see you neil said impatiently and bessie replied i shall stay by mrs goodenough till the tug takes us out there she is now in the distance i can make my way to her very well alone and as it is raining hard we had better say good-bye here in the carriage you cannot help me any and she hesitated an instant and then added you might be recognized neil hated himself cordially and called himself a sneak and a coward but he followed bessie's advice and drawing up the window of the carriage clasped her to his bosom as he said farewell telling her it was not for ever that she was his still and he should come for her some day and claim her promise to him bessie did not contradict him she knew he was suffering greatly and she pitied him while all the time there was in her heart a little song of gladness that she was free taking his face between her hands she kissed it tenderly and said good-bye neil and may god bless you and make you a good and noble man i know you will never forget me too much has passed between us for that but you will learn to be very happy without me good-bye she touched his lips again 
then opening the door herself she sprang to the ground before he could stop her don't get out good-bye she said waving him back as he was about to alight and opening her umbrella and pulling the hood of her waterproof over her head she started in the direction of mrs goodenough leaving neil with such a tumult of thought crowding his brain as nearly drove him wild if he had not fancied that he saw one of his london acquaintances in the distance he might have followed bessie but he could not be seen for fear that the reason for his being there should come out and it become known that a macpherson was allowed to go to america as a steerage passenger so he sat a moment and watched the little figure with the waterproof hood over its head making its way to where a rough-looking woman was standing with an immense cotton umbrella over her sunbonnet and evidently waiting for some one and so bessie vanished from neil's sight and he saw her no more back to the hotel he said to the cabman who obeyed willingly while neil always on the alert closed the windows lest he should be seen and recognized but the air was close and hot and when he thought himself out of danger he drew the window down and looked out just in time to meet the eyes of gray gerald who was driving in an opposite direction there was an exclamation from gray a call for both cabmen to stop and before neil could collect his senses the two carriages were drawn up side by side and he was shaking hands with gray through the window so glad i happened to meet you gray said i wanted to say good-bye for i am off for america america neil repeated and his lower jaw dropped suddenly as if he had been seized with paralysis yes gray rejoined i sail in the germanic with my aunt lucy she came down to liverpool yesterday with some friends i shall find her at the wharf i have just arrived in the train from chester i was in london for a day but i called at your house to see you and learned that you were out of town so i left a little note for you neil and gray spoke very low as we do when we speak of the dead i have been in prussia austria and russia since i left italy but i know i ought to have written and told you how sorry i was for-for what happened in rome if it had not been for my aunt i believe i should have gone back and helped you i here gray stopped for since his interview with jack trevelyan he had never mentioned bessie's name to any one and he could not do so even now to neil who having no idea of the mistake under which gray was labouring and supposing he of course was referring to daisy replied with an indifference which made gray's flesh creep yes thanks they told me how kind you were and i ought to have written you but i had so much to see to i trust i may never go through the like again those landlords are perfect swindlers the whole of them and ought to be indicted he spoke excitedly and gray gazed at him in blank astonishment was he perfectly heartless that he could speak thus of an event the mere remembrance of which made gray's heart throb with anguish had he really no abiding love for bessie that he could speak thus of the trouble and expense her death had caused him gray could not tell but he was never as near hating neil macpherson as he was that moment and he felt a greater desire to thrash him than he had done at melrose when the star-spangled banner was insulted he could not pursue the subject further and he changed the conversation by speaking of jack trevelyan from whom he had not heard since he left him in vienna weeks before i have written to him he said but have received no answer i have also written to miss meredith with a like result and conclude i have no friends this side the water so i am going home you can count on me for a friend always neil said with a sudden gush of warmth as he extended his hand adding hurriedly and now i must say good-bye as i have an engagement au revoir and bon voyage good-bye gray answered a little coldly and the carriages moved on greatly to the relief of neil who had been in a tremor of fear lest bessie should be inquired for and he be obliged to tell where she was during his interview with gray his conscience and his pride had been waging a fierce battle the latter bidding him say nothing of bessie who possibly might not be seen during the voyage as she had promised to keep strictly out of the sight of the saloon passengers and unless necessary not to tell any one except her aunt that she had crossed the steerage thus the disgrace might never be known but his conscience bade him tell gray the truth and ask him to find bessie on shipboard and do what he could to lighten the dreariness of her situation why he did not do this neil could not tell and when the opportunity was passed he cursed himself for a miserable coward and actually put his head from the window to bid the cabman turn back and overtake the carriage they had met ten chances to one if i find him now i'll write and confess the whole thing 
he finally decided and so went back to the hotel where he passed a miserable three hours until it was time to dress for the dinner at the house where his mother was visiting it was quite a large dinner party consisting mostly of matrons and elderly men so that neil's presence was hailed with delight and he was the centre of attraction for at least four young ladies among whom blanche was conspicuous but neil had no heart for anything and seemed so silent and absent-minded that his mother whispered to him in an aside what ails you neil surely you are not fretting after that girl she knew bessie was to sail that afternoon and that neil was to see her off but she was not prepared for the white face which he turned to her or the bitter tones in which he said yes i am fretting for that girl as you call her and i would give half my life to be with her this minute but she is gone she is lost to me for ever and i wish i were dead to this outburst lady jane made no reply but as she looked into her son's face there flashed upon her a doubt as to the result of her opposition to bessie and the question as to whether it would not be better to withdraw it and let him have his way the girl was well enough or would be if she had money and this she would unquestionably get from the old maid aunt she would wait and see and meantime she would give neil a grain of comfort so she said to him i had no idea you loved her so much perhaps that aunt may make her rich and then she would not be so bad a match you must marry money yes neil must marry money if possible but he must marry bessie too and as he looked upon the broken engagement as something which could easily be taken up again he felt greatly consoled by his mother's words and for the remainder of the evening was as gay and agreeable as lady jane could wish but still there was always in his mind the picture of a forlorn little girl wrapped in a blue waterproof with a hood over her head disappearing from his sight through the rain and he was constantly wondering what she was doing and if grey gerald would find her seven on the ship never in her life had bessie felt so utterly desolate and friendless as when she said good-bye to neil and threaded her way through the crowd of drays and cabs and express wagons to where mrs goodenough was waiting for her all her former life with the dear old home lay behind her while before her was the broad ocean and the uncertainty as to what she should find in far-off america added to this there was a clinging in her heart to neil whom she had loved too long to forget at once and although she felt it was far better to be free she was conscious of a sense of loss and loneliness and inexpressible homesickness when she at last took her seat in the tug which was to take her and her fellow-companions to the steamer moored in the river oh how damp and close it was on the boat especially in the dark corner where bessie crouched as if to hide herself from view she had promised neil to avoid observation as much as possible and keeping her hood over her head she tied over it a dark blue veil which hid her face from sight and hid too the tears which fell like rain as she sat with clasped hands leaning her aching head against mrs goodenough who though a rough uncultivated woman had a kind motherly heart and pitied the young girl who she knew was so sadly out of place there were not many cabin passengers on the ship and these were too much absorbed in finding their staterooms and settling their luggage to pay any attention to or even to think of the few german and english immigrants who went to their own quarters on the middle deck and so no one noticed the girl who clung so timidly to the welsh woman and who shook with cold and nervousness as she sat down upon the berth allotted to her and glanced furtively around at the people and the appointments of the place everything was scrupulously clean but of the plainest kind and steerage seemed written everywhere there was nothing aristocratic in bessie's nature and if necessary she would have broken stone upon the highway and still neil himself could not have rebelled more hotly against her surroundings than she did for a few moments feeling as if she could not endure it and that if she stayed there she must throw herself into the sea oh i cannot bear it i cannot why did i come she said as she felt the trembling of the vessel and knew they were in motion oh can't i go back won't they stop and let me off she cried convulsively clutching the arm of mrs goodenough who tried to comfort her there there darling don't take it so hard she said tenderly caressing the fair head lying in her lap they'll not stop now till we are off queenstown when there will be a chance to go back if you like but i don't think you will america is better than wales you will be happy there bessie did not think she should ever be happy again 
but with her usual sweet unselfishness and thoughtfulness for others she tried to dry her tears so as not to distress her companion and when the latter suggested that she go out and look at the docks of liverpool and the shores as they passed she pulled up her hood and tied on her veil and with her back to any one who might see her from the upper deck where the first-class passengers were congregated she stood gazing at the land she was leaving until a chilly sensation in her bones and the violent pain in her head sent her to her berth which she did not leave again for three days and more she knew when they stopped at queenstown and was glad for a little respite from the rolling motion which nearly drove her wild and made her so deadly sick but she did not see the tug when it came out laden with irish immigrants of whom there was a large number of these the young girls and single women were sent to the rear of the ship where bessie lay half unconscious of what was passing around her until she heard the sound of suppressed weeping so close to her that it seemed almost in her ear opening her eyes she saw a young girl sitting on the floor with her head upon the berth next to her own sobbing convulsively and whispering to herself oh me father me father me heart is breaking for you what'll you do without your jenny when the nights are dark and long oh me poor old father i wish i had never come we might have starved together poor girl bessie said pityingly as she stretched out her hand and touched the bowed head i am so sorry for you is your father old and why did you leave him at the sound of the sweet voice so full of sympathy the girl started quickly and turning to bessie looked at her wonderingly then as if by some subtle intuition she recognized the difference there was between herself and the stranger whose beautiful face fascinated her so strongly she said old lady and sure you be a lady even if you are here with the likes of me i had to leave my father we was so poor and the taxes is so high and the rent so big entirely and the landlord a threatening of us to set us in the road any fine morning and so i'm going to ameriky to take a place me cousin left me to be married and if i does well and sure i'll try me best i gets two pounds a month and ivory penny i'll save to bring the old father over but you cannot be going out to work and have you left your father my father is dead and mother too bessie answered with a sob i have left them both in their graves i am going out to work but i have no place waiting for me like you and i do not know of a friend in the world who can help me in faith then you can just count on me jenny mahoney the impulsive irish girl exclaimed stretching out her hand to bessie you spoke kind like to me when my heart was fit to break and it's meself will stand by you and take care of ye too as if ye was the greatest lady in the land as ye might be for i knows very well that the likes of you has not to do with the likes of me and if them spalpeen stares to come round a spearin at ye it's meself will shovel out their eyes with me nails i know em they are on every ship and they are on this i heard one of em say when i come aboard by jove hank that's a neat biddy i think i'll cultivate her cultivate me and dade i'll hank him let him come anigh you or me the blackguard bessie had no definite idea what the girl meant by spalpeens and blackguards whose eyes she was to shovel out but she remembered what neil had said about her attracting the notice of the upper-deck passengers and resolved more fully than ever to keep herself from sight as much as possible she had a friend in jenny to whom she put numberless questions as to where she was going and so forth but jenny could not remember the name of the lady or the place her cousin who had married lately and lived in new york was to tell her everything on her arrival it is a good place she said and if it's companion or the like of that you're wishing to be i spake a good word to the lady who me cousin says is mighty queer but very good and kind when she takes a fancy bessie smiled as she thought of an offer of help coming from this poor girl but she did not resent the offer on the contrary she felt comforted because of it and because of jenny whose faithfulness and devotion knew no stint or cessation during the next twenty-four hours when it seemed to bessie that she must die both from the terrible seasickness and the close atmosphere of the cabin where so many were congregated the fourth day out mrs goodenough said bessie must be taken into the fresh air as nothing else would avail to help her and then jenny took her in her strong arms and carrying her out put her down as gently as if she had been a baby and faith ye must be covered she said as faint and sick bessie leaned back against the door thus fully disclosing to view her white beautiful face which made such a striking picture among the steerage passengers and began to attract attention from the upper deck 
it had already been rumoured through the ship that there was a young lady in the steerage and as it takes but little to interest a ship's company much curiosity was felt concerning her and when it was known that she had come out from the cabin quite a little group gathered in the part of the boat nearest to her and stood looking down at her Look me honeys jenny said frowning savagely at them i'll spy your fun for you and it's not her blessed face ye shall stare at though the sight of it might do ye good and rushing to her berth she brought out mrs goodenough's big sunbonnet which she tied on bessie's head thus effectually hiding her features from sight there jenny continued as she contemplated the disfiguring headgear with great satisfaction them spalpeens can't see you now and if they heave you down anything it's meself will heave it back for what business have they to be taking things from the table without the captain's lave and throwing em to us as if we was a lot of pigs it's just stalin and nothing else the fresh air and change did bessie good and protected by the sunbonnet and jenny she sat outside until sunset and was then carried to her berth that night the wind changed causing the ship to roll in a most unsatisfactory manner and bessie who was exceedingly sensitive to every motion was not able to go outside again but lay on her bed whiter a great deal than the pillow under her head and with a look of suffering on her face which touched the kind-hearted jenny to the quick and sure she'll be throwing up ivory blessed things she'll ate for the next year she said if i could only right side up her stomach i wonder if an orange would do it and counting her little stock of money six shillings in all she took a few pennies and going to the stewardess bade her buy two of the finest and sweetest oranges in the butler's pantry here honey here's what will turn that nasty creepin sickness and make your feet like the top of the mornin she said to bessie and she sat down beside her and held a piece of the juicy fruit to her lips and bessie was trying to take it when a voice outside said to mrs goodenough i heard there was some one very sick and i've come to see if i can do anything for her the next moment a middle-aged lady with greyish hair and a sweet sad face came in and going up to jenny said is this the sick girl for a moment bessie's face was scarlet and there was a frightened look in her blue eyes as she regarded her visitor who continued very gently i am sorry to find you suffering so much my nephew gray has been sick all the voyage or i should have been down here before what can i do for you her nephew gray bessie repeated the words to herself as she stared in bewilderment at the face bending over her recognizing in it or fancying that she did a resemblance to the face which had looked so pityingly at her by her dead father's bedside and which whether waking or sleeping haunted her continually was this woman gray's aunt lucy of whom she had heard so much and was he there on the ship with her and would he know by and by that she was there and come to see her then she remembered neil and her promise to let no one know who she was lest he should be disgraced so when miss gray sat down beside her and taking the hot hands in hers said to her please tell me what i can do for you and pardon me if i ask your name she sobbed piteously no no oh no i promised never to let it be known that i was here i am not ashamed but he is and i can tell only this i am very poor and am going to america to earn my living i had no money for a first-class ticket and so i came in here they are very kind to me jenny and mrs goodenough i am going out with her are you an american yes i am miss gray from allington i will help you if i can was the reply and then bessie's tears fell faster as she cried thank you no you must not talk to me you must not come again please go away or i shall break my promise to neil the name dropped from her lips unwittingly and miss gray repeated it to herself trying to remember why it seemed so familiar to her and as she thought and looked wonderingly at the tear-stained face the impulse of jenny broke in and plays your ladyship if you'll go away now and lave miss bessie to be aisy for a little i'm sure she'll see you again bessie neil miss gray repeated aloud and then she thought of gray's friend neil macpherson and remembered there was a cousin bessie of whom she too had heard could this be she impossible and yet so strong an impression had been made upon her that as she passed out and met mrs goodenough who she knew had the young lady in charge she said to her i hope you will let me know if i can do anything for miss macpherson did she tell you her name mrs goodenough asked in surprise for bessie had confided to her the fact that as far as possible she wished to be strictly incognito on the ship 
miss lucy was sure now and with her thoughts in a tumult of perplexity and wonder she hurried away to the state-room of her nephew End of chapters five six and seven